You guys awake? Yeah. All right, good. That's good. They're awake over here. So, um, so uh, since we got here uh, seven weeks ago, uh, you guys have indulged me uh, in meeting not at 11, but 11 11. Has that been okay? Yeah. Has that been all right? Uh, and this is our last Sunday to do that. I, and, and, uh, I, I thank you guys for letting me do that. It's really given me an opportunity to to be at all three services and to kind of begin to get to know people in, in all different places. And uh, so next week, uh, you're going back to 11, I understand. And uh, and so we'll see. We won't see each other as regularly, but we will see each other uh, in worship. Uh, I know we'll see each other in service. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for for granting me that uh, that favor. Um, we are, uh, it's, this is the last uh, installment of a sermon series we're calling A Mighty Wind. Uh, it's about uh, the events that happened at Pentecost. And for those of you who've been with us for most of that time, uh, you're going to be shocked to find out uh, if you haven't already uh, figured it out. We're in Acts 2 today. <laughs> Again. Not only that, we're in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Again. Um, and... Uh, and so this is the last installment, and we've been looking at how uh, at, at, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit uh, began to work and move in this group of people and gave birth to the church uh, that literally changed the world. And what we've been trying to understand over the past several weeks is what it is that goes into forming a truly great Christ-centered community. And so far, we've, what, what we've pointed out is that... Uh, that, that you really, if you pay attention to how people live and you pay attention to how we interact, interact with one another, you'll, you'll realize that, that people, we, are all wired for relationship and we, we operate best inside of a community. We've also pointed out what separates a crowd from a community. What's a crowd? A bunch of people hanging out, right? What's a community? A crowd of people with passion about a particular thing. In our case, Jesus, right? Um, we have discovered how a group moves from skin deep, fragile relationship to knee deep, uh, authentic community. And today I want to discuss uh, the role and the purpose of the church and what we're called to do once we have gathered together in community. And I think to hear what God has to say about all of this, uh, this is going to challenge you this morning. I'm just telling you, it challenges me. Uh, in order to, to hear this, I think uh, it, it takes a certain level of humility. And so let's prepare for that uh, by spending a couple, of, a couple of minutes in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, please give us the humility we need to hear your word. Open our hearts and minds. Teach us what it means to be your people. Use us for your purposes. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you're with me in Acts 2, I'm going to start in verse 42, and I'm going to, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, and and I'm, we're going to focus on one particular thing today. It goes like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right. Now I've spent literally the last few months studying this passage of Scripture, praying about this passage, this passage of Scripture. And there's this phrase right in the middle of verse 47 that I think is so interesting. It says that, that it says as a church, as a community, that they enjoy the favor of all the people. And I spent some time trying to figure out what this means. And the word favor here is, in Greek, is called karen. And it means favorable disposition or gratitude. So you could substitute gratitude for favor if you wanted to. Uh, and then there's uh, that, the that, that phrase there, all the people. Literally translated, that means all the people. And that might seem funny, but it, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. 
as a church, this entire city, the entire city of Jerusalem, was grateful for this small band of people. It makes you kind of wonder what kind of community this was. And if you want to think about that for a minute, here's what I would, I would ask you to do. Think about the people in your life that you're most grateful for. Or think they're just any people that you're grateful for at this particular moment in time. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example of what I'm thinking. Uh, you know, my wife's a teacher, and, and I've got a young kid in my house. And so, uh, as with many of you, uh, there's a big, huge, uh, momentous event coming up next week. Uh, and that's the beginning of school, right? And so, I, I know that, you know, we've got one in our family that's getting ready to go to fourth grade. I know that any time you change grade, I mean, what grade are you guys going to be in? Senior. That's kind of important, right? Every time you change grades, it's a milestone. And I'm so grateful uh, for these kids and these teachers that work and work and work and, and, and learn and learn and grow and grow. Um, I feel a lot of gratitude right now for kids uh, getting ready to go back to school. It's, it's exciting and it's daunting and it's scary and it's sometimes it's not all that much fun, but it's so important. Um, so that's what I'm grateful for. And you may have other things that you're grateful for right now. I'm really grateful for the kids. Uh, I got to spend some, I'll talk about this in a little bit, I got to spend some time with our youth last week. I'm really grateful for them as well. Um, but it's important to, so uh, as we think about the people that we're grateful for, the people who have our favor, it's important to point out that favor does not mean uh, approval, okay? I have a hard time believing that everyone in the city of Jerusalem agreed with this early group of Christians. In fact, uh, we know from other passages that the, uh, of Scripture that this group, of this early group of Christians, uh, weren't willing to compromise what they believed and how they lived just to make everybody like them, right? And we know that, um, that often in this early group that their faith was brought into tension with the ways of the world and that they faced an awful lot of persecution. We talked about this along the way. Uh, they faced persecution from both religious and political uh, authorities. But, but even so, there was something about the way that they lived that earned the favor, the gratitude of all the people. Am I down again? Awesome. Michael, there we go. All right, I'm going to grab a, a stand here. I have been technologically challenged all day today. Um, you don't even know. But uh, there was something about this group um, that, that caused them to earn, uh, earn the favor of all of the people. Um, they were making a positive impact in the lives of, of, of the people they lived with, whether or not that you were part of their, their small community. Um, they made an impact. And I've been wrestling with this all week, and I'm, and I'm sad to say that I'm not sure that the same thing could be said about the church today. Um, from where I'm standing, it looks as if the if Christians today have fallen out of favor with the people. The people are not, don't hold a lot of gratitude about the church. And there's this interesting thing that happens, to give you an example, there's this interesting thing that happens when, uh, when, when, I, meet, when I meet someone outside my place of work. Uh, so I might meet somebody and we'll strike up a conversation or maybe we'll have a series of times that we're together and we'll strike up a little bit of a friendship. And at some point along the way, either earlier or later on, they learn that I'm a pastor at a church. And their reaction is really kind of funny. It's like, what? No! You're like normal. And then it's almost like they feel sorry for me, like I have some sort of uh, fatal disease. And they have a hard time believing that somebody that they enjoy talking to is a pastor at a church. Uh, so from where I'm standing, it seems like, in a lot of ways, Christians have fallen out of favor with the people. Uh, for instance, Christians are often seen as reactive and defensive. You know, it, it, I, whenever I see that there's a pastor coming on one of the big news shows, I know that we're getting ready to have an argument. 
Uh, and and I, that's not what I want to be known for at, at, as a Christian. We're, we're, we tend to be argumentative. We tend to be drawn toward controversy. Uh, nothing tends to get the church talking more or faster uh, than a good controversy. I don't, think, uh, I don't think younger generations have lost faith in God, but I do think perhaps they're well on their way to losing faith in the church. Uh, there's a guy named Dan Kimball, and he wrote a book called, um, the title of the book is, They Like Jesus, But Not the Church. Uh, and Kimball spent over two years interviewing and getting to know this diverse group of 18 to 30-year-olds who had grown up outside the church. And um, he was shocked to find out that almost everybody that he interviewed had virtually nothing bad to say about Jesus and nothing good to say about the church. And no matter how we feel about that, there seems to be this disconnect between who people understand Jesus to be and who they understand the church to be. And the Barna Research uh, Group recently did a study uh, where they asked non-Christians ages 16 to 29 about their perception uh, about Christians, their current perception about Christians. And here's what they found out. 16 to 29 year old people who are not Christians, 87% of them said Christians are judgmental. 85% of them said Christians are hypocritical. And this is the one that blows my mind. 71% said that Christians were insensitive to the needs of others. Now there probably isn't anybody in this room who's more tired of hearing statistics like that than I am. But there seems to be this disconnect between who people understand Jesus to be and their perception of the church and whether that perception is accurate or not doesn't really matter, it's still out there. And for a lot of people, it's reality. So let's be clear, the people's favor is sort of a byproduct of what was going on in the early church. The people's favor is not what we're after, okay? What we're after is people's salvation. Remember the last line of that scripture is, and, and the number of people who are being saved was added daily, right? So what we're after is people's salvation. And if we want to effectively communicate the gospel, because that's what we have to do, then we're going to have to consider why Christians are being perceived the way that we are. We're called to be the light of the world, and it feels like to me that the light is burning a little more dimly than it should be in Christian circles. So I want to wrestle with this today. I want to try to understand what's going on and what it's going to take to recapture the favor of the people to effectively communicate the gospel to a world that desperately needs it, to a world that desperately needs salvation. And that's why I think the proper place to start is, is to reconnect with this church that Jesus envisioned. So I'm going to invite you, if you've still got your Bibles open, to turn to the left. Uh, I want to go to the, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 16. So Matthew 16, I'm going to start in verse 13. And I'll wait until you get there. Nothing makes me madder than when I'm looking for Scripture and it's already been read by the time I found it. Are we good? Let's, don't give me more pages turning. Okay. So Matthew 16, uh, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. All right. So I want you to hold on to that idea of a rock and on the gates of Hades. And I'm going to teach you a really useful Bible study tool. You up for that? Mm -hmm. All right. So whenever the author mentions a specific place, you need to pay attention. Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was located in the northern part of Israel. And it was the, it was the center for pagan worship. The city was famous for this giant rock. And there was a temple built on this rock. And this temple was the worldwide worship center for the Greek god Pan. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of gory detail here, but let's just say that there was some seriously messed up things happening in this temple, okay? Really messed up. Now, next to this temple, in the rock, there was, a, there was this big, huge crack in the rock. I mean, enormous crack. You could walk into it. Do you know what the name of that crack was? The Gates of Hades. Yeah, the Gates of Hell. Isn't the Bible fascinating? Do you see what's going on here? I don't doubt for one second that when Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, that he was referring to Peter and Peter's leadership. But, I think there's something else going on here. See, he didn't just accidentally end up in Caesarea Philippi. This wasn't a place that any devout Jewish person would ever think about going. Jesus went there on purpose. And it is here that Jesus first speaks about his church. And Wade's version of that is this. Jesus keeps saying things like, I'm going to go right smack dab into the middle of all this confusion about who I am, about what life is all about, and I'm going to go right into the middle of all this brokenness and all of this darkness, and I'm going to start something new. I'm going to build my church, and nothing, Stop it. Jesus envisioned his church reaching out and embracing a lost and broken world. Not retreating from it. And today, often people identify themselves as Christians based on the amount of distance that they can keep between themselves and the world. And instead of engaging the world, we retreat from it and we form our, little, our own little subculture. And we listen to our own music and we associate with our own people. And we isolate ourselves from the world. When I was growing up, there was a period of time where I gravitated away from Christianity. And there were a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons uh, was that it seemed like there, the Christians were a bunch of people who were sitting around waiting to die. And what I heard was, wait, here's what you need to do. You need to, you need to say this prayer. And you need to realize uh, uh, that Jesus is your Savior. And then you need to sit back and wait because uh, when you die, you're going to get to go to heaven. Well, I had enough problems in this life. And I had questions about this world. And that wasn't good enough for me. And, and later I realized that Jesus has an awful lot to say about this life. And, and that's when it began to make a bit more sense to me. And, I, and I, think, I think we talk a lot in Christian circles about life after death. I think we talk about life after death far more than Jesus ever did. And look, it wasn't Jesus' primary goal to get people into heaven. That wasn't the point. The point was to get heaven into the people. Think about how Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The gospel declares that this life matters. This world matters. Being a Christian isn't about sitting around waiting for the next life. It's it's not about escaping this world. It's about following Jesus into the broken places of the world and partnering with him and putting the pieces back together. There's a guy who does this, uh, who's a hero of mine. Uh, his name is Rob Morris. And Rob had an experience in one of the darkest places on the planet uh, that changed his lives and the lives of some more people forever. And so I want you to check out his story. They're going to. They're going to run a video uh, for me. You guys ready for that? We are Love 146. The statistics surrounding child sex trafficking and exploitation are staggering. It's estimated that billions of dollars every year are generated from the sale of human beings. In fact, human trafficking is estimated to be the second largest income generating syndicate in the world. Statistics estimate that two children are sold every minute. In 2002, a small group of friends and I traveled to Southeast Asia to see what was going on firsthand. While there, we went with a couple of undercover investigators into a brothel posing as customers. Having to pose as the very thing that we were so repulsed by was one of the most disturbing experiences of our lives. 
We found ourselves standing in a room, looking through glass windows at little girls with red dresses on, being sold as commodities. These girls were sitting there watching children's cartoons on little television sets. We were standing shoulder to shoulder with men who were purchasing these little children, these young girls by number. These girls had even the dignity of a name stripped from them. One of the most disturbing things that night was the look in these children's eyes. There was nothing left there. There was no life left in their eyes. They were just staring robotically, blankly, at these crackling little television sets. But I remember there was this one girl, and my guess was that she was probably new to the brothel, and that there was still a fight left in her eyes. She was the only one not looking at the television sets. She was staring out of the glass at us. There was still a fight left in her eyes. There was still life left there. Number 146. That's how it came to be. Love protects. Love defends. Love restores. Love empowers. We are love. Does that bother you? Yeah. It should. There are things in this world that are not okay. That shouldn't happen. And we can be so quick to identify what's wrong in the world, but often I think the church is so slow to do anything about it. And the interesting thing about Robbie here is that there isn't a lot of difference between us and between Rob. The difference is uh, he not only identified something that's wrong, but he's doing something about it. He's gone to the gates of Hades, and he's taken the church with him. Jesus didn't come to start a nice social club where we could get together every Sunday morning or once a week. Jesus started a revolution, and I've heard it said that in a revolution, there's no such thing as an innocent bystander. There are no, there's no neutral in the kingdom of heaven. And as the church, we aren't, we aren't given the option to sit back and wait. And the world is too broken for the church to sit back and do nothing. There's a question that serves as sort of a litmus test for the health of your church. And, uh, and, and the question is this. If they were to close the doors, if they were to tell you that you couldn't meet anymore or be together, who would notice? I think if they were to close the doors of this church, I think a lot of people would notice. I think a whole lot of people. It, it's an honor to be the pastor here and to see uh, the difference that you all are making in the community and in the world. And I, my list that I'm going to give you is incomplete. I, I understand that. Uh, but food pantry, clothes closet. There's a group that drives elderly people around when they can't get to where they need to get to. There's uh, I got to spend some time, like I said, with the youth group last week, and, uh, and we were really blessed um, to have some youth who have gone really deep into their faith. We've got uh, Cub Scouts who are crawling around this place all the time. This morning I got here early, there were Boy Scouts getting ready to go and do something. Um, we've got 120 kids over in preschool over here, and they're learning a lot of things that kids need to learn in preschool, but they're also learning about Jesus. Our youth recently experienced a, a they used to recently did a fast, they had a fasting experience and, and became aware of how famine uh, affects others. Uh, and, and again, this list is incomplete, I know, but, but all of this is done in the name of the gospel. It's done in response to a need in the world. But I also know that there are plenty of folks who, who come here every week or at least that often. And they may not have taken the next step to become involved. And you might be one of those folks sitting here today. And coming to worship is great. I love worship. Worship is a necessary thing that we do. In fact, Valerie and I are going to be talking about worship in the next sermon series for about five weeks. Worship matters. But you won't fully know what church is all about, or particularly this church is all about, unless you become involved in something. Until you serve. 
You can't show up here on any given Sunday evening and not see uh, and be inspired by uh, the enthusiasm of our youth and their, and their adult leaders. You can't, be, you can't come up here on a Tuesday morning uh, and, and not be inspired by the alarming number of hungry people that get fed out of this building. You guys, in your announcements this morning, you probably heard about some small group opportunities that are coming up, classes that are coming up, opportunities for you uh, to dive deeper into your faith and into the Bible and into relationships with others. The possibilities are endless. One of the things I'd, I'd point out to you, between the preschool and our Sunday morning uh, children and youth programs, look at how many lives that we've impacted. Uh, it's amazing to me, uh, you know, in the history of this church, how many of our youth group have gone on to be pastors? It's crazy. That means that there's something happening here, right? Um, and look, right now, I, I think we're doing all of that work with somewhere in the neighborhood. What would you say, maybe 10 to 15? people maybe, volunteer, adult volunteers, uh, between all of that. Think what that might look like if we had 50 adult volunteers, marshalling kids, into the kingdom. You know, uh, when I was here for BBS, get here at the beginning of BBS and at the end of BBS, all those kids would be gathered up in the, in the big sanctuary next door. There's, I don't know, I mean, there's like 70-something kids, and the place was just crawling with kids that were excited. It could look that way every Sunday morning. You know that? That's what's possible. A church that earns the favor of the people is a church that allows Jesus right, that goes with Jesus right into the broken places of the world and partners with him, putting those pieces back together. And another thing we have to do is we've got to model something different. We've got to model something new. This early church grew at an incredible rate. They started, uh, they went from around 120 people to over 20 million people in 200 years. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That's ridiculous. Love. And one of the primary reasons for their growth was their lifestyle. It was the lifestyle of believers. It was a radical commitment to practicing community. We live in a world that is desperate for something real, for something honest, for something that isn't a gimmick. Things today can feel so superficial. Our world is we're surrounded by buzz and gloss and hype. And we slide down the surface of things. Just imagine how attractive a community of people would be that is real and honest and, and practices compassion and forgives one another and doesn't quit when things get tough and people disagree. Imagine how appealing a community of people would be that did life together, that opened their homes to one another, that made an effort uh, to meet one another's needs. What would that look like? It's pretty obvious that this new community of Christians was open to new members and people on the outside looking in felt that this, these folks were approachable and the Lord added to their number daily. People aren't usually drawn to an exclusive club. Or exclusive groups are they? One thing I think we struggle with today is that we spend far too much time trying to figure out who's in and who's out instead of instead of just introducing people to Jesus. Jesus will do that work that we think we got to do. We need to be in the business of building wells, not fences. What does he mean by that? We got anybody who has worked on a ranch, has a ranch, does ranching, that kind of thing? Anybody? Everybody? Okay. Have you ever fixed a fence? Part of the part of the whole idea of ranch, ranchers and farmers build fences around their property, and they build fences around their property to keep their livestock in, to keep other things out, right? And uh, and part of what they do is they spend a lot of time repairing those fences because they get broken down all the time for a lot of different reasons. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but in places like Australia, where um, farms and ranches, are, they're like huge, they're vast. And if you, it's not realistic to build a fence around a farm or a ranch in most of Australia, because if you did, you wouldn't have enough time or enough manpower to maintain the fence. It would be 
eternally in disrepair. It would take years to even build these things. So what they do is they is they build wells, uh, and and, they, and and the wells provide water to livestock, uh, and, and so the livestock gravitate to these wells, and and so so the people who own property don't have to keep their livestock in the fences. They keep them in with, with water. You know where I'm going here, don't you? All too often, churches are about building fences. Oftentimes, deliberately, sometimes, oftentimes, unconsciously, we build fences. But people thirst for relationship without judgment, and Jesus offers living water. And as the rock that he built this church on, we need to be a vessel of living water. We need to build wells for people to come and drink at and not build fences and gates for people to come in and out if we agree or if we're nice. And what I'm suggesting to you, what we've been suggesting these last few weeks, isn't easy. It isn't even normal. It's not even normal in most churches. Because it requires that each and every person put all of their expectations, all of their agendas, all of their, this is how we've always done it. But they pick those up and they place them on the table for God. You know, when we started our time together seven weeks ago, we talked about the table. Do you guys remember that? We talked about gathering around the table in community and we talked about who's invited to the table. Do you guys remember who's invited to the table? All of God's people are invited to the table. And all of God's people are all the people. God's inviting us to this table. He's inviting us to place all of those things I just talked about on the table and to listen and to wait for God to speak. But it requires us all, all of us, to be willing to surrender everything. Amen? When I was growing up in church, we, uh, we used to sing this song. Maybe you guys, some of you guys know, know it. I think, it's, uh, I think it's number 139 or something in the middle. Uh, I know we don't have memories in here. It's called I Surrender All. You guys remember this? Anybody remember this song? I Surrender All. Man, we love that song in my church. We would sing that song. Everybody would raise their hand. I Surrender All. But I know that when I was singing that song, and probably still when I sing that song today, I'd say, I Surrender All. Except for that, and this and some other thing. I Surrender We can't do that. we got to surrender everything. And what we think is the most important thing, maybe God doesn't think it's so important. Let's pray together. Gracious God, may we be a people to hold on to things loosely so that we're able to hand them over to you. And that we're able to not do the things that we're familiar with, that we're able to not do the things that we've always done because they worked but that we're able to do the things that you are calling us to do. That our community is crying out that they need. That broken people are calling for us to help them. May we be a people who lay everything at your feet and make them holy. May we be a holy people. Stand together.